Okay, this one is a lecture about are caffeine and tea good for you? Coffee and tea good for you? And caffeine and coffee are kind of a hot topic. Tons of people drink coffee and I think this is a good litmus test for somebody who knows what they're talking about versus doesn't. You're going to see all these BS artists on the internet telling you how great caffeine is. Any popular, you know, best-selling food is going to get a lot of positive bogus press saying oh it's you know cures all these health problems so the way to get past that is ask yourself what does caffeine actually do and what it does is it increases the stress response it blocks adenosine receptors but it mimics the acute stress response and that it increases cortisol and catecholamines and you know one of the things i'm very interested in the brain caffeine lowers cerebral blood flow you know this one study says 27 percent and they mentioned uh, several other references here. A 250 milligram dose of caffeine, which is a pretty standard amount of caffeine, lots of people drink far more than 250 milligrams a day, has been shown to reduce resting blood flow, uh, cerebral blood flow, between 22% to 30%. And then here's three other references, and you'll find plenty more of them about caffeine lowering cerebral blood flow. So, what's the most common cause of dementia? Chronic cerebral. Uh, hypoperfusion, lack of blood flow, as well as excitotoxicity, those two things go together. So what I'm trying to say is, why would you want to be ingesting something that's decreasing your cerebral blood flow, potentially in accelerating your rate of dementia? Um, I'm going to go through the physiology in more detail, but just think about it. It causes increased hypertension, high blood pressure. What's the number one risk factor for silent stroke? Hypertension. What else does it do? It causes insulin resistance, elevating blood glucose. What's like the other number two risk for uh, silent strokes and cognitive impairment is diabetes. These all go together. Almost over 90% of the demented patients I see, those are the main two things I got. They have both, diabetes and hypertension. They go together, hypertension and diabetes. And I'd say it's at least 95% or more have at least one of them. And so what I'm saying is why would you want to be ingesting a substance that increases your risk of diabetes and hypertension? Uh, I'll go into some more detail, but that's a key point. Okay, you got to learn how to get past the BS. You know, a lot of times old animal studies or old research studies done before there was profit. Um, each profitable thing, like I said, has its own mythology around it. Like milk's good for bones. No, milk actually causes osteoporosis. So don't put coffee in your milk and don't even drink any coffee. It would be the best thing to do. Milk does the body good. Yeah, right. Milk increases the risk of type 1 diabetes, autoimmune disease, premature puberty, breast cancer, atherosclerosis, prostate cancer, on and on and on. All right, so... Um, and like I said, all these moronic, most of the health sites on the internet, they're all totally wrong and bogus. I would say most of the so-called nutrition experts on the internet are bogus. They're going to tell you coffee is good for you. Endless BS. Um, uh, let's see. Let me close this door. It's kind of loud. The kid lifting weights. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Caffeine is a stress equivalent, increasing cortisol and catecholamines, um, the epinephrine uh, and uh, norepinephrine, same thing as adrenaline and noradrenaline, plus the cortisol. You know, cortisol is not what you want to increase for no reason. Cortisol is the opposite of melatonin. Melatonin is good. Antioxidant helps you sleep, you know, anti-aging. Cortisol is the opposite. It's part of the stress response. You need cortisol and catecholamines for acute energy, energy mobilization. Being chased by a tiger in the dark is a typical stress response metaphor. Um, I think the peak caffeine effect, some paper claims 45 to 60 minutes. Other one says 90 minutes, like with some energy drinks, depending on the other ingredients. Um, what does cortisol do? It increases sodium retention. That's called a mineralocorticoid effect. The point is increased sodium retention means elevated blood pressure. You're also going to get elevated blood pressure because the catecholamines increase cardiac contractility. Uh, so hypertension is bad. It, it damages the body when you're hypertensive for no reason um, on a chronic basis. Uh, many years ago, I injured my back and uh, I was given a solumedro, you know, corticosteroid dose pack. And I just took it for like a week or something. I went, I, I went to get a checkup and my blood pressure was like really high. It was like, a, you know, the upper 130s over something. You know, I was a young, healthy guy. There's no reason. My blood pressure is totally fine. That was a, a surprise for me at that time. And of course, it went back to normal immediately afterwards. 
Uh, cortisol suppresses immune function. Now that's a big deal. When you suppress immune function, you not only are more vulnerable to infections and viral reactivations, you're also at increased risk for cancer. Your immune system protects you from cancer. You don't want to mess up your immune system. Okay, you know, why do old people have more cancer? I'll tell you one of the things, I look at their necks all the time from neck MRI and CAT scans. Young people got a lot more lymph nodes and bigger lymph nodes than old people do. As a matter of fact, you can't use a criteria for old people to decide whether or not to biopsy a young person because a young person has so much more uh, lymph node size and number presence. And the point I'm making is <clears throat> that's part of the old person's decreasing uh, immune function, making them more vulnerable to cancer. It's also because cancer takes you know, many years, potentially decades to grow. Uh, but still, I'm saying you don't want extra cortisol on board for no reason. Cortisol increases gluconeogenesis, production of glucose in the liver, increased insulin resistance. All these things increase blood glucose to make it more available for the muscles to run from being chased by a tiger in the dark. That's how you can think of it. Being chased by a tiger in the dark, an acute energy mobilization to uh, enable you to survive the next five minutes. All that matters is surviving the next five minutes. So everything that's long-term gets put on a shutdown. Forget about wound healing. Forget about growing uh, bones and muscles. Forget about preventing infections. Nothing matters but to survive for the next five minutes. So that's good to help you survive the next five minutes. That's bad uh, way to manage your body uh, for longer than that. Okay, uh, it causes insulin resistance because it's elevating blood glucose, elevating blood lipids, and it's decreasing the number of glucose type four transporters translocating to the plasma membrane, let's say in skeletal muscle and other locations. That's bad, because remember we talked about glucose type four transporters for glucose also being present in the hippocampal neurons of your memory center and your brain of your substantia nigra, one of your motor centers that's associated with Parkinson's disease. So basically you run the risk of depleting important neurons in your brain of the energy that they need, okay? And again, for five minutes, not a big deal, but for a chronic daily basis, not a wise move. And do you catch the problem here? You're hypertensive. That's bad, okay? You're increasing glutamate uh, release across the neurotransmitters in your hippocampus, so you're ramping up the metabolic rate, but you're simultaneously dropping cerebral blood flow. You get that? Increased metabolic rate, decreased cerebral blood flow, increased risk of apoptosis. Not good. Um, cortisol and catecholamines, increased blood lipids, more insulin resistance. More likely, your person is going to become fat. So they get a big bulky fat on the back of their neck. Uh, potentially when you really have high chronic uh, corticosteroids, it's called buffalo hump obesity. Um, the prothrombotic, the elevate blood fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is a major clotting factor. So is von Willebrand factor, factor eight, antihemophilic factor. Platelet activation and aggregation is increased. That's bad because platelet activation and aggregation can hide metastatic cancer. You look that up, you'll see that. That's why stress can increase your risk of metastatic cancer. So this is bad. You're going to decrease. You also decrease myocardial perfusion a little bit. So you can lower cardiac perfusion, simultaneously make yourself more prone to clotting. Not good. While you're speeding up heart rate, you're increasing cardiac contractility. You increase the risk of having uh, tremors, increased palpation, increased atrial fibrillation, um, slight decrease in heart perfusion I mentioned there. Uh, when you block the brain adenosine receptors, the, the sort of the biochemical effect is, is decreased GABA, but increased dopamine signaling. It'll make you more awake is the bottom line. It has, you're going to be more awake, more alert, which is good if you're tired. You got a long drive that you must make at that moment. Um, yeah, fine. Have a cup of coffee in that instance, but habitually not good. You don't sleep as deeply. You'll notice if you cook coffee, your sleep improves significantly. You'll feel younger. Um, cortisol, like I said, it's the opposite of melatonin. They're like on a seesaw, you know. Normally, you want cortisol to just come up in the morning. That's a normal thing for it to do. Give you a little extra energy to get your day going. Go find some food. But then at night, you want your melatonin high because you can sleep more deeply. Um, like I said, it increases glutamate neurotransmitter in the hippocampal synapses, increasing metabolic demand of those neurons. When added excessively, can cause an increased anxiety, impulsiveness. And again, this is the opposite in this case also of oxytocin. Sort of like the cortisol has this effect one way and then... Um, melatonin and oxytocin the other way. You want to be in a much of a, more of a parasympathetic melatonin and oxytocin phase of existence to the extent that's possible. Catecholamines are siderophores. Sidero means iron, four means to transfer. It'll transfer iron to bacteria and this increases the risk of infection because the body sequesters iron. Remember, I don't know if you remember the picture I drew of the guy walking through the desert. It's hard for a human to walk through the desert and survive because there's no water. Well, the way we prevent bacteria from being activated in our body 
is by sequestering iron, keeping it away from the bacteria. They can't grow without it. Um, that's the other thing like an egg yolk and the egg white, the protein of it has a complete deficiency of iron. So a bacteria though can get through the shell, it can't get through the egg white and make it to the yolk to do any damage. We all have a dormant bacteria in our blood and it's pretty obvious when you think about it. You can get reactivations of tuberculosis, you can get reactivations of Lyme disease, reactivations of syphilis, reactivations of all these viruses, especially the herpes virus family, HSV1, HSV2, shingles, and a bunch of others. Um, and in addition, that's why blood transfusions don't work as well as people think because the dormant bacteria is one of the big reasons for that. Okay, what are the problems with caffeine ingestion? It increases urinary excretion of calcium. That's called calciura. So that increases your risk of kidney stones, increases your risk of kidney failure over decades. Um, you'll also increase your urinary excretion of magnesium, which is a vasodilator. A lot, most people are deficient in magnesium, so they're worsening their magnesium deficiency which is going to increase the risk of brain excitotoxicity, losing brain neurons, becoming stupider. Okay, and I worry because, you know, I like to read a lot of books and I've studied a lot of authors, how many authors, they just have a drop in their quality of their writing when they get into their 60s. And so I didn't want that to happen to me. So it's another reason why I'm so careful about all this brain stuff. All right, um, it has a mild negative effect on thyroid function. Here's a reference if you're curious about that. Um, I said the only thing it's good for is if you're having to uh, sleep. Potentially athletic performance, but there's some problems with athletic performance too. It's not as big of an improver of athletic performance as people think. Um, cognitively, it might give you more energy for doing a routine task, but it doesn't really improve your ability to think creativ crea creatively uh, when you're stressed out. Think how you behave when you're stressed out. Impulsive, quick actions, sort of in a limbic you know, uh, mammalian part of the brain rather than the cortical human part of the brain uh, functions best. Um, I didn't start drinking coffee myself until my surgical internship because I was sleep deprived at that time. And, uh, you know, I finally quit it some years ago and I'm glad that I did. I'm going to talk about that here in just a sec. Okay, um, there's also, let's say there was, when there's caffeine in coffee or in green tea or other tea, It'll have a slight increased estrogen level in Asians and black. This was a pretty limited study, so I don't know how significant that is. But it came out from the NIH. There's a news release in 2012. Here's the research if you want that reference. The point that I'm making is a lot of people try to say, oh, this or that, wonder food, you know, green tea or something. To me, it sounds like BS. I wouldn't go buy it. Teas have a tendency to accumulate fluoride, which is associated with lowering IQ. Uh, they have a tendency to accumulate aluminum, which is also neurotoxic. Um, and it's also a metalloestrogen associated increased risk of breast cancer in the long term over decades, cognitive impairment. Um, tea sometimes will even contain lead, according to Mike Adams in his book, Food Forensics. But that might be really rare. I don't really know too much about that. Um, and I don't know if that's significant or not. I, my botany professor is a Dr. Thomas when I was at Stanford many years ago. He told me herbal teas, he would never drink one. He said they're <clears throat> very poorly regulated, in his opinion, back in those days. And he felt that. Nobody understood the ingredients well enough, so why take a chance? People, you know, everybody's scared of spiders, you know, scared of a, of a, you know, a snake or something. They're not instinctually afraid of chemicals. You should be afraid of chemicals. Just like I was, you know, I gave a lecture the other day about, you know, the typical patient in my experience. They're not scared of major surgery. They're not scared of very powerful drugs. But, oh, man, they're freaked out and afraid of a vegan diet. The exact opposite. I'm the opposite. If I can eat a vegan diet and avoid major surgery, I'll do it. And avoid toxic drugs, I'll do it. Okay, and I'm scared of chemicals, man, because I, I did a lot of work with chemicals. Chemicals are dangerous. Okay, um, all the time I see people not even ventilating the room when they're, they're working with complex chemicals. Stupid. All right, coffee habit becomes an obligation. That's what I didn't like. You have to have that cup of coffee at the same time every day. For example, I got in the habit of having a, co a coffee every day at 7 a.m. and 9 a.m., and it would screw my day up because on a weekend I would want to sleep in, but I couldn't because I had to wake up and get that cup of coffee so I didn't get a withdrawal headache. Then I often do lots of surgeries, you know, or imaging guided procedures. And I would have to get my cup of coffee before I felt comfortable doing the procedure, and I didn't want to get a rebound headache during the procedure. And I would sometimes, you know, it would make me have to change my whole routine to go get that cup of coffee before I would do the case. Um, I could potentially delay a case. And I, I didn't like being so obligated and dependent on the coffee. Um, what I did is to quit the caffeine was I tapered each cup. I was at two cups a day for years. Um, I would decrease by 25% each day. So it would take four days to come off the cup of coffee completely. And, you know, you never want to quit more than one cup at a time. 
I didn't have much cravings when I quit the first cup, uh, but when I quit the second cup, I had intense cravings. For three days, I felt sad. Um, probably, you know, it was like a dopamine effect on the brain. And then I had cravings significantly for two weeks. After that, it all went away and my energy came totally back to normal. I don't have an, an afternoon lull or lag that I used to get from the caffeine dose in the morning. So I'm very glad to have been done with it for years now. I would never go back to it. I sleep much better. Um, I think it makes you more resilient to have to get rid of this other this chemical here as well. So anyways, hope that's helpful.